Let's discuss DKA. Diabetic ketoacidosis is the combination of hyperglycemia, ketosis, acidosis, dehydration, and electrolyte derangements. It affects patients with diabetes, particularly type 1 diabetes. Up to one-third of new-onset type 1 diabetes present in DKA. Other common DKA triggers include poor insulin compliance, infection, and dehydration. DKA is ultimately due to insulin deficiency and results in altered metabolism and fluid shifts. Let's examine DKA at the cellular level. Insulin facilitates glucose uptake into cells and also promotes fatty acid synthesis. When insulin levels fall, like when a type 1 adolescent refuses to take their insulin, two primary changes occur, hyperglycemia and ketosis. With insulin absent, glucose struggles to enter the cell and begins accumulating in the extracellular compartment. Intracellular glucose falls and the body becomes convinced it is starving. Fatty acids are mobilized from adipose tissue and a stress response begins with release of corticosteroids and glucagon. The glucagon plays a primary role in shifting metabolism towards ketogenesis, as well as gluconeogenesis and glycogenolysis, which serve to further worsen the developing hyperglycemia. The mobilized free fatty acids make their way to the liver and are metabolized into ketones, acetoacetate, and beta-hydroxybutyrate. In the absence of glucose, these ketones serve as energy sources for the brain and vital organs. In DKA, these ketones are overproduced and accumulate, causing ketosis. Excess ketones suppress the appetite and may lead to nausea and vomiting. Ketones are also acidic, so as they accumulate, an anion gap metabolic acidosis develops. The body attempts to manage this acidosis with a compensatory respiratory alkalosis. In severe DKA, this progresses to the classic Kussmaul breathing pattern with deep labored gasping breaths. As glucose accumulates outside the cell, it results in hyperosmolarity. This drives an intracellular to extracellular fluid shift, drawing water into the extracellular space, and that water is usually accompanied by potassium. The kidneys attempt to normalize the osmolarity. Glucose is excreted to reduce the hyperosmolarity, which results in polyuria. This excretion can be significant, leading to dehydration and a volume deficit of 5 to 10 percent, depending on DKA severity. Dehydration may manifest as polydipsia. Sodium and potassium are also excreted, and despite the kidney's conservation efforts, a whole body sodium and potassium depletion develops, although plasma levels still may appear normal. Renal impairment of any kind results in more severe DKA. DKA ranges from mild to severe, based on the severity of dehydration, metabolic acidosis, and altered mental status. Dehydration is estimated via signs and symptoms of shock like tachycardia and hypotension, and you should always presume a volume deficit of 5 to 10 percent. The pH and anion gap are measures of acidosis, with mild pHs ranging from 7.1 to 7.3, moderate from 7 to 7.1, and severe pH less than 7. Altered mental status may be present in DKA of any severity, but is more typically a sign of severe DKA. A prompt initial assessment for severity is critical, including evaluation for shock and altered mental status. Critical initial labs are drawn to further characterize the DKA and include a glucose to evaluate hyperglycemia, chemistry to evaluate anion gap, renal function, and electrolyte abnormalities, beta-hydroxybutyrate, which is more reliable than urine ketones in evaluating ketosis, and a blood gas to evaluate acidosis. The first step in treatment is to address volume depletion. Rapid fluid correction should be limited unless hemodynamic compromise is present. The remaining fluid deficit is corrected over 24 to 72 hours. The next step is to address insulin deficiency. An insulin drip is started and titrated hourly with a goal glucose of 100 to 150. The initial hyperglycemia corrects rapidly, so dextrose-containing fluids should be started to prevent hypoglycemia. Third, electrolyte repletion and monitoring. DKA patients are total body sodium and potassium depleted. 
Once insulin is reintroduced, it drives potassium back into the intracellular space, and hypokalemia can subsequently develop. Rehydration fluids in DKA should therefore contain potassium, usually a combination of potassium chloride and potassium phosphate. Fourth, the anion gap in acidosis is monitored closely. As insulin restores glucose metabolism, ketone production falls off, and the kidneys begin clearing ketones. Of note, bicarb is not a reliable measure of acidosis in DKA. Bicarb should also not be given as it prolongs ketosis and can contribute to cerebral edema. Finally, monitor for cerebral edema. Though rare, it has a high mortality and is more common in severe DKA. No clear cause has been established, although there are multiple proposed mechanisms. Signs of cerebral edema include new or worsening altered mental status, new or worsening headache, recurrent emesis, irritability, and lethargy. Many institutions have specific fluid protocols, insulin titration schedules, and serial lab draws specifically for DKA. Refer to yours for specific treatment parameters. Insulin and IV fluid replacement are continued until hyperglycemia has resolved, anion gap has closed, pH has normalized, and the fluid deficit has been replaced.